Senator Phil Gruth, also from Chittenden, uh, Chair of Senate Ed. Senator Rebecca Ballin from Wyndham County. Allison Clarkson, I have the pleasure of representing Windsor County District. And I am David Susi, representing Rockland County. David, welcome. Good evening. For the record, Damian Leonard, Legislative Council. Um, so, for everyone here who's in the room uh, with us, there is a handout uh, sitting on the edge of the table here which summarizes what I'm going to kind of provide as my overview. It's also available uh, on the, or should be available on the committee's website as well. Um, if not currently, then after tonight. Can you, Damien, just pick up your mic a little bit so everybody so make sure your mic, because that actually is an amplified mic as opposed to a recording mic. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Great. Yeah, but it's not true. All right. Okay. So, uh, as as the chair mentioned, um, the summary that we got, what I'm going to walk the committee through, is the bill as it passed the house. Um, as you all know, that uh, that could change here. Uh, the committee can go ahead and amend the bill. Um, and so we will go from there. And I'm actually grab a handout here because okay. I lost the file on my iPad there. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, the way the bill works is it, it uh, primarily sets up a new paid family leave program within the Vermont Department of Labor. And employees uh, are covered by the program if first they're eligible for unemployment insurance in Vermont. So in other words, uh, they, they're, uh, they meet the definition of an employee for purposes of unemployment insurance. And then that they've been employed in Vermont for 12 of the past 13 months. So meaning after you've worked in Vermont for 12 of the past 13 months, you're eligible to receive benefits under the program. It would apply to all employers in Vermont uh, and it would provide benefits for a leave of absence from employment, for a serious illness of a family member, uh, including a child or stepchild, a foster child, a parent, a grandparent, a sibling, your spouse, or the parent of your spouse. Uh, and it would also provide leave for parental and bonding leave, uh, including the birth of a child or the placement of a child 16 and under for adoption or foster care, or in the instance uh, if a grandparent is standing in the place of a parent in terms of being the primary caregiver for a child, they could also take leave within the first 12 months after the child's birth if the child's biological parents don't take leave. Um, it does not provide a leave of absence for an employee's own illness uh, or disability, uh, which is something that other states' programs do provide leave for. The program is funded by a 0.141% deduction from employees' wages, and the deduction is on the first $150,000 of an employee's wages. So for most employees in the state of Vermont, that means it's a 0.141% deduction on all of their wages. Uh, and an employer may elect, but is not required, to pay that deduction on behalf of their employees. Uh, the contribution rate would be annually adjusted by the General Assembly uh, based on the recommendation of the Commissioner of Labor, which would take into account the projected costs of the program in the coming year, as well as the maintenance of a reserve in the, the fund for the program uh, and any balance remaining in the, the fund for the program. The benefits for the program under the House bill are set at 80% of an employee's average weekly wage or 40 hours a week at two times the Vermont livable wage, uh, which for those of you who don't know or don't remember is currently set at $13.03 per hour. Um, this is a wage that's set by uh, statutory formula and then determined by our joint fiscal office every two years. So in other words, uh, that would be about $26.06 times 40 hours a week, and it's 80% of the average weekly wage, or that two times the Vermont livable wage, whichever's less. 
uh, and the benefits would be subject to income tax. That's an important thing to note. Um, and the benefits are provided for up to six weeks of parental or family care leave uh, and could be used, and this is six weeks within any 12-month period. So in other words, if you have a child and take six weeks of leave, and then you have another child two weeks, two years later, not two weeks, <laughs> two years later, you would have another six weeks of leave in that 12-month period, assuming you haven't used leave in the interim for family care. Uh, and the Department of Labor, like I said earlier, would be processing and administering the benefits. Uh, the program, under the House bill, the effective date was set for last July 1st, with contributions beginning to be collected this July 1st, and then benefits becoming available 15 months later, on October 1st of next year. Obviously, because we've passed the initial effective date, any version that the Senate might pass would have to move those effective dates out by at least a year. Uh, so that would be, assuming nothing else changed, this coming July 1st for the program to take effect so that the department can begin setting up the infrastructure necessary, contributions being collected July 1 of next year, and benefits becoming available October 1 of 2020. Are there questions from the committee? No, thank you very much. I want to mention for people who are coming in, and there will be other people coming in, that if you want to, we have about 20 people on the witness list at this point. If anybody wants to testify, uh, Kayla is our assistant. But she's taking names uh, over there, and we'll continue to take names throughout the evening. Um, we'll uh, start off with uh, three minutes. As I said, we may uh, be able to take a little longer if we uh, don't get too many more uh, witnesses. But I will call uh, the first witness and then uh, also mention who is on deck so we can be ready. Our first witness is Karen Lafayette, followed by uh, Karen Casey. Good afternoon. You're going to be just my test case okay. for us today. Would you rather look at this, or would you just rather have me tell you when time's up? No, I'm good. Okay. That's easy right, for me. I'm going to do this so it stays up. You've got to remember not to have my glasses on, otherwise it's just a blur. Oh, well. Okay, right here. Hi, I'm Karen Lafayette, and I'm representing the Vermont Low Income Advocacy Council today. The Vermont Low Income Advocacy Council supports the implementation of a statewide family leave policy that would allow Vermonters to have access to paid, job protected leave to take time to bond with or care for a new child, recover from a serious long term illness or injury or care for a family member with a serious long-term illness or injury. Smart employment policies like paid medical leave and insurance are essential in this economy where both parents need to work to make ends meet, especially for low-wage earners and single mothers. Times have changed. It's not possible for someone in the family to be able to take time off of work and lose that income to care for an aging parent or bond with a new infant. Having access to parental and medical leave are critical in today's working environment if we want to support women in the workforce, if we want to support young families, if we want to strengthen the economy and our businesses. Being able to meet your family responsibilities and remain financially secure has all kinds of social, physical, and mental well-being benefits. Having that time could be the difference between a young mother being able to reduce her anxiety and worry, breastfeed her baby, and realizing the well-documented benefits that 12 weeks of bonding creates. It could be the difference between an elder parent having to spend time in a costly nursing home when they could be cared for for a short period of time in their own home. One of the key elements of Vermont paid proposal um, as introduced was the 100% wage replacement. Where it might seem reasonable to reduce that benefit to something less, that is the real equity for low income earners, especially those close to the poverty level, whose choice it will be to hand over um, <clears throat> a two week old infant to costly childcare if available, or leaving your job, acquiring debt, and needing additional state assistance. 
So I would ask the committee to keep close, as close between 80% and 100% of wage replacement as you can. If we want uh, uh, an economy that works for all Vermonters, if we want people to have choices and be able to remain in the workforce, if we want to support small business that can't afford to provide these benefits alone, if we want happy and healthy families to remain in and come to our state, then creating a statewide insurance program is the way to ensure universal access to an important benefit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, Kara Casey followed by Tiffany Scharf. Okay, right now, hold on. Technical malfunction here. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. My name is Kara Casey, and I'm the Economic Justice and Housing Specialist at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Today, I'll speak with you briefly about how paid family and medical leave would positively impact survivors of domestic and sexual violence. When living in poverty, barriers to overcoming trauma and leaving abusive relationships increase, and too often there are too few opportunities to obtain economic security, independence, and safety. What paid leave looks like in reality is a survivor being able to take time off, being able to take the amount of time off that they need, and doing this without depleting all of their resources. And that means money, but also sick and vacation time. Access to resources that increase economic stability are essential in a survivor being able to leave an abusive relationship and rebuild a life after abuse. It has been proven that women who have access to paid maternity leave are significantly more likely to increase, to report increased wages and are less likely to be receiving public assistance in the year after their child's birth. In addition to the increased economic security for survivors, there would also be direct long-term benefits to their children. After leaving an abusive relationship, the victim, victim is often left as a sole provider for their family. Studies show that children's resiliency is increased when mothers are employed full-time. That is, gainful employment has a positive influence on, on their children's recovery from witnessing domestic violence. So if a mother is able to care for her new baby, ill family member, or herself without losing out on income and without having to quit her job, it can improve overall long-term outcomes for her and her children. The Vermont Network strongly supports H-196, and we urge the committee to restore the personal medical leave that was in the original bill. We believe paid family and medical leave insurance would help make victims and their families healthier and more economically secure so that current and future generations of Vermonters can thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tiffany Sharp, followed by Dan Ward. Good evening. My name is Tiffany Sharp, and I live in Fairfax with my husband and our three sons. I have been working at UVM full time for the past 13 years. Paid family and medical leave is extremely important to me. As my employer does not offer paid family leave, or up until very recently, short-term disability insurance. Ten years ago, my first son was born. My ex-husband and I were fairly low income and did average save up, both monetarily and in accrued paid time off. Looking back, I must have been crazy as I thought I'd be able to take a mere four weeks for maternity leave. Little did I know that our baby would suffer a severe case of meconium aspiration syndrome and spend several weeks in the NICU. By the time he was released, my leave was basically over and I had to ask my employer for additional unpaid time off. The financial instability led to increased stress and eventually a diagnosis of postpartum depression. The financial burden could have been prevented had a family and medical leave plan been in place. In 2017, I was pregnant with my second son, due in April. And when we first decided to have another child, I told my husband we would need to find a way to fund my maternity leave because I didn't want to be in the same situation as me and my ex-husband had been in. 
He agreed and we saved some of the money we had from refinancing our home and invested it in hopes of growing what we already had. A few weeks before my due date, my husband hurt his shoulder at work and was out off and on for a couple of weeks doing light duty work as was available. The limited hours forced us to dip into our maternity leave money. Because he was working some hours, he was unable to claim workers' compensation. A week overdue, our son came into the world quick, quickly and a bit dramatic via emergency C-section. Because of the C-section, my husband ended up taking more time off than planned to take care of me as well as our newborn. The paid family and medical leave program would be a game changer for families like ours. Instead of going massively into debt and negatively impacting the economy in our area, we would have been able to stay current on our bills. The program would allow families to experience infinitely less stress and let them focus on bonding with their child or caring for an ill family member. Families are stretched too thin these days. We're expected to work, take care of our home and family, and be active members of our communities with no real support from our local government. When we don't offer paid time off for people to deal with these things, it harms everyone. The individual suffers physically, mentally, and financially. The employers struggle with employee retention, distracted employees, lower productivity, and the inability to plan for emergencies. People, okay. <laughs> People are forced to seek benefits such as SNAP, WIC, and reach up in order to make ends meet. This doesn't make sense financially for the state. We have other types of insurance in place, such as unemployment insurance. It just makes sense to have paid family and medical leave as well. It encourages families to continue working after having a child as they have adequate time to bond without the financial stress. In closing, I would suggest that you look long and hard at the state of affairs in Vermont right now. Families are moving away because they cannot afford to stay here. We have an aging population that soon won't be able to support our economy. We need to not only pass this bill, but restore it to include 12 weeks of family leave and include personal medical leave. This will allow Vermont to both retain the young families that are already here and also encourage new families to move to the area. I was born and raised here, but if we continue the way we're going, we may be forced to move someplace more affordable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dan Ward, followed by Aaron Flynn. of dozens more. I'm what's called a community foster parent, and I take children ages 0 through 17. Being a community foster parent means that when a child enters my home to live with my family for an undetermined amount of time, they've never even met us before. The traumaty and tragedy of that is incomprehensible. Paid family leave that includes the placement of a child or children in a home for foster care would mean more family members, grandparents, aunts and uncles, people who actually know and already love the children would be able to offer their homes instead of asking strangers like me to stabilize their children. The foster family shortage would diminish and some of the trauma of entering foster care would be mitigated for the children. Many of my former foster children have moved on from my home to live with bio family, family of origin, as they should whenever possible. When a child enters foster care, their needs are intense and immediate, especially when they're newborns. Why should a grandparent have to send a brand new baby to live with me until the baby is old enough for daycare in order to maintain their employment? We must have a system that supports maintaining families. I'm honored to serve my community and support children by being a foster parent, but doing so has had an undeniable impact on my employment and income. My work is critically important to me. For me, eligibility for leave time would not impact my drive to work, but rather reduce much of the stress of the first few weeks of intense appointments and meetings that accompany adding a new child or children to my home while I continue to work. We need to do better for Vermont's children and families. Please support paid family leave for all types of families. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the work you do. Erin yeah. uh, Flynn, uh, followed by Chloe White.
Thank you. I apologize. I realize I printed this much smaller font than I intended to. So I think we've all been there. <laughs> Yes. You're all set? Yep. Right. Uh, so good evening, and thank you all sincerely uh, for sharing your valuable time to hear my story today. By way of introduction, my name is Erin Flynn, and I'm a wife, a daughter, a sister, and a mother. I am a native New Yorker who moved to Vermont to attend graduate school and have been working as a civil, civil servant for our agency of human services for the last five years. I'll start by saying that I'm not here under the assumption that my story is any more challenging or captivating than most of the middle class working families I know. And I hope I don't misspeak when I say I'm here representing them as much as I am myself and my family. I would also like to acknowledge that I'm not naive to the fact that you all, as leaders and policymakers, are faced with unlimited problems and needs for which you have a very limited resources to address. I know that you grapple with complex poverties. Uh, I'm sorry, complex problems such as poverty, homelessness, and access to basic needs such as affordable health care and education on a daily basis. My testimony here today is not meant to discount those hard truths. I'm here today because I personal, personally believe that we as a collective society need to shift our thinking and culture around what it means to be a full-time working mother in this time and this place in our history. Since I was a young kid, I was regularly asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? I've never imagined myself not working. The drive to build a professional identity and the desire to find self-worth worth and satisfaction through the contributions of my service has defined me for much of my adult life. Behind all of that, as one in a family of four kids who grew up with a very large extended family, having children of my own was a given, one day when I was ready. <laughs> Eventually, that far off distant concept um, of how people manage to work and raise families in modern times was right in front of my face, beginning with my preparations for maternity leave three years ago. Well, there are many benefits that I'm very fortunate to receive as, as a state employee, maternity leave is not one of them. After a lot of brainstorming and soul searching, here's what my maternity leave plan looked like start working an extra 10 hours a week to build up comp, comp time so I could have enough paid time off to stay home with my daughter as long as possible. This included a stint of bed rest, and I worked up until the day I gave birth. I returned to week just eight, eight weeks later and somehow struggled through the guilt, mental, and physical trauma and just sheer exhaustion that would be my norm for the next year. And then I'll spend the next threes in mental health counseling and physical therapy trying to recover. <laughs> We did all this because we did not want to start our young family off with a burden of debt that would impede us from providing for our daughter's future. We did not want to lose what savings we had accumulated to support our goal of one day becoming homeowners. While returning to work eight weeks after childbirth was one of the hardest choices I've ever made, I know there are many who are forced to make harder and unthinkable choices on a daily basis. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to I'll try to summarize. Uh, so becoming a full-time working mother was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, but it's also one that I'm most proud of. I'm proud to stand before you on equal pay day to proclaim that I love my family and I love my job. Both these things are true at the same time. I firmly believe that no woman should have to choose between growing her career and growing her family. And I believe that this starts with ensuring that all women have the right to enough paid time off from their jobs to attend the birth of their children, recover, and bond with their babies before returning to work. I'm not econ an economist, but it doesn't take a very advanced statistical analysis to know that birthing and raising children is one of the primary root causes contributing to the gender wage gap. All I have to do is open my eyes and look around to know that that is true. So just to illustrate my point, and, and then I'll summarize here, um, I just want to share with you what it would mean for me to have a second child. As th things stand right now, any leave would be completely unpaid. This is because nearly every single hour of paid time off I have accrued it is accounted for in the almost 31 days that my daughter's daycare center is closed annually. Combined with the at least monthly sick days that come along with raising a child, toddler in a child care setting, not only would any time I were to take be unpaid, but I would now also have the expense of $1,000 a month to pay someone else to take care of my toddler while I stayed at home with my newborn. It's been a long and difficult journey to find a child care provider that we really love, and I just wouldn't put my daughter nor her provider through the experience of pulling her out 
to stay home for just a few weeks so that we could go through the agony of finding a provider all over again. Thus, I'm faced with the same choices I was faced with before, but under even more difficult circumstances. I could stop working and stay home to care for my children. I could burden my young family with thousands of dollars of debt, or I could not have another kid. For reasons I've already defined, none of these options work well for me. And I think I'll, I'll stop there, even though I've had more to say. And I thank you very much. Thank you. you can submit, if you'd be kind enough to submit your testimony to Kayla, that would be great electronically. Okay. If ever, yeah, that's true for everybody. If, okay. Especially if there are things you wanted to say that you didn't get to say. Thank you so much. And that goes for anybody who wants to submit written testimony and doesn't want to testify. They can also submit that as well. We already have a packet uh, as a good start. Um, Chloe White, followed by David Rose. Good evening. Uh, I'm Chloe White from the ACLU of Vermont. Uh, thank you for having me here to talk about our support of paid family and personal leave. Uh, we think paid family and personal leave is crucial to true economic and reproductive justice. No one working a full-time job should have to choose um, to risk job loss or financial ruin in order to recuperate from illness or care for their loved ones, whether a newborn baby or a sick spouse or child. Um, we think that paid family and personal leave would help to eliminate that cruel choice. This is a question of basic fairness for all, work, for all workers, but this bill is particularly important for women. Um, I think it's very auspicious that you're having this hearing today on Equal Pay Day, where white women finally make uh, the same amount of money that uh, men did in 2017. So today, more women work full time than ever before, yet they continue to bear disproportionately the burden of caring for children and sick family members. Paid leave enhances women's economic equality and provides better economic security for all workers. With paid leave, employees are healthier and more productive, and employers can save money through retaining better staff. Um, nationwide, only 12% of private sector workers have paid parental and family leave, and only about four in 10 have access to paid medical leave. It's past time for Vermont to act as a leader and lift up Vermont workers and families. So we ask you to please support paid family and personal leave for the benefit of all Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you very much. David Rose, followed by Jill Schwarzenegger. Thank you for the time to speak today. My name is David Rose. I live up in Burlington. Uh, I grew up in Manchester, where my family uh, has lived since 1999. My father is a network administrator at the Vermont Country Store, and my mother is a higher educator in the local school system. That was also her job in March of 2006, when she received a call in the early evening from the local ski mountain and learned that my father had gone off a jump, landed on his back and neck, and broken his T11 as he fell. He had been airlifted to Dartmouth and was paralyzed from the chest down. Now, my father's story has been retold probably a thousand times, but as with many caregivers, partners, and families, the day-to-day -day path of healing is rarely heard outside the home. Um, our experience regarding family leave begins with my father's injury, but it centers on my mother's experience during the ordeal and in the months that followed. Um, as a caregiver, my mother's ability to have time away from work was afforded to us by accumulated paid sick days and the generosity of co-workers who were able to donate their own sick days for both my parents um, as a meager supplement after our spring. And this gave her the flexibility to visit my father at the specialized rehab hospital six hours away in Philadelphia and to research opportunities in adaptive housing, further mental care without making desperate choices or putting a family to death. But Vermont workers should not have to deplete our accumulated time off when emergency arise. Emergencies arise that require longer term leave. A guarantee to Vermonters of secure income for both patient and caregiver for 12 weeks would be life changing for a family facing an emergency like a paralyzing spinal cord injury and would help families avoid dipping further into their social services. The weeks that followed my father's injury were spent learning how to return to productivity, but outside of this healing process, it took considerable time to handle all the medical paperwork, phone calls, and long distance travel to appointments with specialists. And uh, in just one example, it took several weeks, even in the, the months after he uh, finally returned home, 
uh, to have the car adapted with hand controls, complete the paperwork to regain his license, and begin driving again. During this time, uh, traveling to routine appointments became solely my mother's responsibility. My dad also left the hospital with a prescription for oxycodone to address the immense pain that he was in at the time. And he was able to wean himself off that pain relief because he was not attempting to return to work full time right away. For both the patient and caregiver, it was essential to have enough recovery time to avoid complications or dependence on the painkillers. He was injured March 2nd, 2006, and returned to work in late May. Um, that was approximately 12 weeks. And he spent a week of that at Dartmouth Hitchcock, six weeks at the Rehabilitation Center in Philadelphia, and five weeks recovering at home. Like most paraplegics, he never regained any sensation below his chest, and also, like most paraplegics, his life was, is just as active now and as productive now as it was 12 years ago before his injury. Um, I'll just wrap this up. Um, to say that healing from a life-threatening injury and providing care for a family member should not require that we deplete our paid time off or and go into debt or rely on the generosity of Vermonters in our communities to donate their paid time off or their sick days um, in the way that our community supports us. Um, my family believes that it's time to make the privilege of safe, secure recovery a right to grant until the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jill Charbonneau, followed by Elizabeth Casey. Hi, uh, Jill Charbonneau. I'm president of the Vermont AFL-CIO, and I live in Middlebury, Vermont. Uh, I would like to applaud the House bill for expanding the definition of family, but to say, however, without expanding <coughs> the ability of workers to take this leave, the hours, we'd like to see the hours of eligibility for how much work time work in a year to be cut. Many workers, uh, I can tell you, both union and non-union construction workers should look no further than rock of ages to find people who routinely work, who have gaps in their work, who they're unemployed, but have a job through the rest of the year. They would be ineligible to use this, but they would be eligible to pay for it. So I ask you to include them. And I also ask you to include personal uh, illness. I have a story to tell, like other people here, that I have not told publicly. Um, October 19, 2000, my significant other killed himself. And I worked for the post office. I had sick leave, I had vacation time. I could take care of my family and still have an income. And that was crucial to our recovery. And I think everybody deserves that. Thank you. Elizabeth Casey, followed by Katie Wozniak. It doesn't like. Did you really say you did a good job in this last time? I did. I did. I did a good job. It just won't stop. Sorry. I'm really trying. Is that okay? My name is Elizabeth Casey and I'm a ski resident. For the past 15 years, I've been honored to provide early care and education for young children. I have been a witness to the magic of a child developing and parents growing with families. So when it came time to have a family of my own, I thought I would know what to expect. I had seen the hardships and the struggles. I knew the challenges that lay ahead to find childcare. I knew that the United States is ranked at the bottom of developed nations when it comes to providing paid family medical leave. I have a bachelor's in family science and a master's in early childhood. Certainly knowing all of this, I would be able to navigate the first year of our child's life. We put off starting a family for a long time. We, like so many, had student loans. We wanted to buy a house and made the financially safe decision to settle for a duplex. When we finally got pregnant, we met with a medical insurance representative to get a clear picture of what childbirth would cost. Despite all the preparation, we were uncertain how we would be able to afford not receiving full paychecks for an extended amount of time. After all, most early childhood educators aren't making a living wage, let alone living off 60% of that wage. Our daughter was born on December 5th of 2015. She was 43 weeks when, we were, when she was delivered. I had been working up until I went into labor. 
One of the many challenges with not having paid family leave is that it means every day of work matters. Can you imagine if I would have started using my vacation time at 38 weeks? I could have been waiting around five weeks for our daughter to come leaving me with zero vacation. Oh, how I wished I would have had taken time to relax and feel refreshed as I entered into this new amazing role. My daughter arrived healthy, and we had the usual challenges adjusting to life as parents. Luckily, she was born and tax season arrived. We got our taxes done as fast as we could that year, and our return helped us get through my 12 weeks of leave. I received six weeks pay at 60%, six weeks unpaid, and was able to keep my job, but every penny mattered during that time. My husband used his vacation time, he accrued working at UVM, to stay at home with our daughter after I went back to work. When he returned to work, we still didn't have childcare. We had put our names on almost 10 different provider wait lists upon learning of our pregnancy. No one had openings. After talking with my boss, she agreed to give me the summer off in return at the start of the school year in the fall. Shortly after, I got a call from our provider. She had a spot open in her home in Burlington. Unfortunately, because I committed to taking the summer off, my teaching spot was already filled for the summer. In order to hold my childcare spot, I would have to pay almost three months of tuition, roughly $3,000. We used the rest of our tax return and accepted help from our family. We were lucky at all. It worked out for our family. In preparation for sharing our family story tonight, I reached out to friends and asked them to share their stories with me. Each one of them shared their struggles. Despite being familiar with the system and navigating it and planning ahead, they all shared the financial burden of, was stressful. They wished they didn't have to go back to work only to be forced into a pumping in closets, cars, and laundry rooms just for two ounces of breast milk. Each one of these women, regardless of their challenges, said that they were lucky ones. In the end, maybe it was that they were lucky, but they were also resilient. They made the best of challenging situations because they had to, because if the system forces us to, if we want to financially contribute to our family. This piece of legislation is more than just about being in the beginning of the end of life for loved ones. It's about creating a system that demonstrates that it cares for the well-being of each community member. In 2015, before my daughter was born, I had the privilege to be part of the Early Childhood Leadership Institute for the Stone Center. One of the discussions surrounded identifying our values. Our presented prompted us to discern on our values. He stated, if we know, want to know what we value, take a look at our wallet and our calendar. I want to thank everyone in this room tonight for putting this event on their calendar. I value healthy families, I value community, and I want Vermont to share those values too. Not only in theory, but in the way it governs. This bill, however small a step, is imperative to creating a Vermont that is competitive and thriving. And I strongly urge to, for you to support this legislation and extend it to 12 weeks. Thank you. Katie Worsniak. Said, uh, uh, Worsniak. Worsniak. Followed by Eric Sperl. My name is Katie Worsniak. I'm from Northfield. I was born and raised in Vermont. I left for many years but came back here to raise my family. I currently work for a small family run business with a very generous benefit package for the size of the business, but it currently does not have an option for any long term leave. I support paid family and medical leave insurance in Vermont for many reasons. In 2002, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. She used all of her sick leave, vacation, and personal leave in order to receive treatments. Once she ran out of those hours, her, her coworkers generally, generously donated their sick leave to her. And then she ran out of those hours as well. Fortunately for her, she worked for an amazing boss, some of you might know, Annie Noonan, who refused to let her go without pay. She continued to re receive a paycheck until she passed away a few months after her diagnosis. There are not many small businesses and organizations that are able to be that generous. The bill as passed for the House removed the personal leave portion of the bill. I strongly urge you to put that language back in. For many employees, a cancer diagnosis means working through chemo and radiation treatments, coming to work because they can't, af can't afford to stay home, even though they're nauseous. They risk exposure to viruses and bacteria with weakened immune systems. I can guarantee you that everyone in this room knows someone who has gone through these treatments. It is unimaginable to me that if not for Annie, my mother would have had to go back to work just to earn enough money to live. 
She was what? I wasn't even close to crying when I saw it. <laughs> she was blessed to get to focus on trying to survive cancer and not paying her bills. Should we want that for all Vermont who are struggling with illness? I have two beautiful daughters. When my first daughter was born, I took four months off from my job unpaid. I had to apply for WIC to help with the grocery bills. With my second daughter, I only took two months off because we just couldn't afford to take any more time. I feel blessed that I was able to get as much time with him as I did because I've heard from so many other women who could only take weeks off because they couldn't afford more. Unfortunately, staying home was not even an option for my husband. As we needed at least one paycheck to survive. He had to miss out on those first precious months, as is the case for so many fathers. Paid family medical leave insurance would help parents get time with their newborn babies and give each child in Vermont a leg up on their early development. The version that passed the House reduced the weeks of leave allowed from 12 to 6. Again, I implore you to restore the language to the original 12 weeks. A month and a half is just not enough time to bond with the child and recover from the trauma of giving birth. I support this bill with the revisions mentioned earlier because it just makes sense. And we want young people and families to come to Vermont to live or stay in Vermont. We have to find a way to make it easier for them. If we want people to recover from illness and return to work, we need to allow them that option. If we want our children to thrive, we need to let their parents spend time with them when they're born. It's just the right thing to do. Please support this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chairman and members of the Senate Committee for accepting my testimony today. My name is Eric Spurl, and I'm a single 35-year-old father of two little ones, five and seven. I currently work for The Alchemist in Waterbury, Vermont. I was born and raised in Vermont. I'm proud to say I've worked and lived here my entire life. I'm here today to support the paid family medical leave because it goes way beyond the dollar amount. It touches the fundamentals that we need to instill in our young generation. Compassion, stability, supporting one another especially in times of need, and most of all, love. Before working at The Alchemist, I worked quite a few jobs, many different jobs. I worked in excavation and in building material sales. And even though they were good jobs and they had decent benefits, sick days, vacation days, etc., it was often impossible to get those benefits. Being a single father of two kids, having 50-50 custody, it was my responsibility to care for my kids when I had them. There are times when my kids were sick and had health issues, and my employer would ask me if their mother could take the time off, knowing that we weren't together, as if it were her responsibility. I felt helpless at times. It was like pulling teeth to get time off, and they wouldn't play unless it was myself that was sick, and I had a doctor's note. So I'd use vacation time, and when I didn't have vacation time, I'd go without pay. And as far as you need to provide for your kids, for your loved ones, with the care when they're sick and you don't worry about and you have to worry about whether or not you're going to get paid or if you'll still have job security. Being a single father with only one income, this situation threatened my livelihood and my ability to provide a safe and secure place for my children. I also was unfortunate to have witnessed what too many families do, my family not being able to be there for their loved ones when they were needed most came down to my family members either losing their employment or not being able to be there for their mother, something that seems barbaric to have to decide in this day and age. Today, I work at The Alchemist, and I've been there for about two years, and I'm very grateful that they offer a generous benefits package, which includes sick paid time for you and your family, as well as paid family medical leave. And after having my past experiments, experiences with other employment, this is a huge blessing. To be able to provide the love and care that my family needs in troubled times and have a company, which I like to call my family, that supports and recognizes the need for that. I have stability for my children, knowing I can be there for them physically and financially if, God forbid, a medical situation occurs. Now my children know that if something happens, I'll be there. They don't have to worry about being with someone other than me until I'm done work or whatever the situation or them having to be there, or them having me be there physically, but my mind being preoccupied with the stress of our livelihood. I don't want to worry 
I don't have to worry about seeing others go through what my family and mother, many others have had to go through in times of need when something happens to a loved one. Paid medical leave goes way beyond the money. You can put a dollar in anyone's pocket. They'll spend it how they see fit because it's theirs. It's a false sense of security. We can give people a system that can make a difference in time of need. We can provide real stability for our families. Stability, security that parents can give to their children or parents when they're sick without the burden of worry. Through the paid family medical leave, we have an opportunity to come together for the greater good of everyone and be able to be there for our families, young and old, that's selfless and priceless. In closing, I'm a voice among many who see a clear present need for paid family medical leave. I wish everyone could have the benefit that the family gives peace and mind security. Thank you very much. Say Longo, uh, followed by Chelsea Frisbee. I'm only going to go over the three minutes, but only slightly. <laughs> Um, my name is Faye Longo. I'm a native Vermonter and a resident of East Barry. I'm also a full-time employee, a part-time college student, a daughter, sister, single mom, and the breadwinner of my family. I'm here to express my full support for the paid family leave bill, to encourage you to ensure personal illness and injury leave is included, and to extend the weeks to as close to 12 as possible. I can speak to the benefits of this bill from personal experience as a mother and as a woman. My father passed away suddenly last year. My mom has battled with cancer most of her life and continues to. And I have two children who both have medical issues. There is literally not any time in my life when this bill would not have benefited me. Last year, my father who lives in Connecticut had a terrible car accident. He was in ICU, then hospice, until passing away nearly a month later. I traveled to see him when he first had his accident and used up any combined time off I had accumulated. I then took unpaid time to be with him and to care for him in his final weeks of life. Finally, I had to return to work. I simply couldn't afford to take any more time. And my father passed away the day after I returned. Paid family leave would have helped me in more ways than I can express. It took me a long time to get caught up financially after losing just those few weeks of pay, but I had no choice. I had to choose debt and significant financial hardship in order to care for my father. During a time when I should have been mourning the loss of my dad, I was working nights and weekends on top of my already full-time job to get caught up and make ends meet. It also put me in a tough position with my employer at the time. Having used all my combined time off to be with my dad, I don't know what I would have done had myself or one of my children gotten sick. And I hope you guys can see how that really could have quickly snowballed out had that happened and got it. And I have also been in a position to work for and with nonprofits throughout our state for most of my life, serving our most marginalized populations. And working with these people, I can assure you that my experience is not unique. According to the Center for American Progress, 55% of the 20 or so million people who took unpaid leave through the Family Medical Leave Act used it for their own medical condition. Only 18% used it to care for the health of a child, spouse, or parent, which is why leaving in the personal illness and injury is so important. Also, female-headed households with dependents are consistently the poorest households, not just in Vermont, but across our nation and the world. This remains true, even though mothers are now the majority breadwinners in families and make up nearly half of the workforce. As Kate Bann of the Center for American Progress states in her article, Economics of Misogyny, despite the central role of women in our economy, no serious effort has been made to modernize our work to reflect the needs of women, and indeed all people, to care for their families, and I would add, personally, for themselves. More and more women are entering the workforce every day. And more and more of them are single parents or primary caregivers of some sort. This is a pattern that is not going to change. The face of our workforce becomes ever more feminine by the day. Vermont has always been a state of firsts. But when it comes to supporting women and families, we have failed. 
we must start passing legislation like House Bill 196 to turn this grave injustice around and to show our commitment to supporting women and their families in our state and in our workforce. Imagine 30 years from now, when my daughter Amira is my age, I pray that she won't face the struggle that I did as her loved one lies dying. I hope that she would be able to take advantage of House Bill 196 and focus on saying goodbye to her loved one rather than worrying how she'll keep the bills paid. Again, I implore you to pass the bill to ensure personal illness and injury leave as part of it and to increase it to 12 weeks. And thank you for hearing my testimony. Told you only slightly over. You were perfect. Thank you. supports our employees not only with a positive work environment but also with pay and benefits 
that will enable our our employees to stay with us as they mature and settle down. And if they choose to start a family, most of our employees are in a livable wage, and all of them have disability insurance and access to paid time off. They have the opportunity to invest in a company matched retirement account with a small contribution on their part. They enjoy the peace of mind of full health care coverage. But missing from this list is paid family leave. That a, a benefit that nearly every working person is going to need at least once in their working life. And I might add, this is a benefit that's enjoyed by every other worker in the world besides people living in Lesotho, Papua New Guinea, or most states in the United States. Although many larger companies can afford to offer this benefit to their employees, it would be far too expensive for most small businesses to afford to pay people while they are not working for a number of weeks. Yet, aside from health insurance, I think paid family leave is arguably of more importance and value than any of the benefits that we currently offer at our business. At some point in our careers, most of us will be faced with an event that compels or forces us to take time away from work. At Red Hen, we've seen workers face these kind of dilemmas regularly. In just the last five years, six of our employees have had babies. Each time, these new parents, men or women, have dealt not only with the strain of having a new baby in the house, but they've also been faced with the dilemma of how to maintain their income. Although we would love to offer them a solution as their employer, our cash flow could not support such an expense. Fortunately, a solution has been offered, and that's H-196, of course. With the insurance that this bill would provide, employees in Vermont would be able to take time away from work when their family needs them most without a concern for how they will pay their bills and put food on the table. If ever there was a good example of strength in numbers, this is it. For so many businesses, pulling all of our resources is really the only way we can ever get our employees the coverage, coverage that they need and deserve. I would also like to add that we supported H-196 as it was originally proposed in the House. We would like to see some of what we see as the essential elements of the original bill restored. First on that list for me is that is to have the employees be able to take uh, leave to recover from their own non-work related illnesses or injuries. We also think it's important for the leave time to be at least eight weeks, if not the originally proposed 12. I know that, re that making these changes will have a small impact on the cost of the program, but the increase will be small in return for these significant improvements. As currently written with the 0.141% payroll deduction for the cost of an employee making $24,000 a year, that's about $12 an hour, this would just be $33.84 annually. But if we restore the aforementioned benefits, uh, it, it will increase somewhat. But the fact is that even at the original 0.93% figure, this is a, a heck of a deal. So I want to add that we continue to uh, support a model that shares the cost between the employer and the employee. If, the portion, if that portion of the bill is not restored, I predict that many employers would see the value in contributing to this cost and join Red Hen in doing so, thereby reducing the burden on employees even further. In either case, we feel that the value of this insurance cannot be overstated. Such a plan is really the only way we can make sure that all Vermonters, regardless of income level and place of employment, can be ensured that they will be able to care for themselves and their family when the need arises. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for red hand. No, no, no. <laughs> the downfall. <laughs> it makes the best sticky buttons. The entire world. Well, I'll try for Yeah. Lisa Mason, my friend is Siegel. Hi, I'm Lisa Mason. I'm the owner of Fiddleheads Cuisine in Moortown, so the second business owner to go. Um, it's a small business, a business of one. Um, and I love being a small business owner. I like helping the economy grow. Um, I like being connected to the members of my community. It's been an incredibly successful and rewarding venture over the past seven years where I've been full-time on my own. However, being self-employed comes with a lot of challenges. As a self-employed entrepreneur, there's no paid time off for illness or parental leave, not to mention access to affordable health care. Being eight months pregnant, with my second child, with no paid maternity leave in sight again, um, this is a challenge that has never been more relevant to me personally. It's almost on a monthly basis that I consider giving up the idea of giving up my business and getting a job somewhere else that has benefits. Um, it's truly difficult to make ends meet without them, but I love what I do, and I love knowing that what I um, contribute 
that are contributing to the health and the happiness of my community members, but also the health of the Vermont economy. Um, when my husband and I decided to start a family, it was a major concern that we wouldn't have any paid time off between the two of us. But we knew it was something we wanted to do and a step we wanted to take. So we did it, and we continued to struggle financially as a result. At the same time as we have rising expenses due to a growing family, we also have to drain our savings to pay for maternity leave, um, as well as the cost of pregnancy and health care. Um, so this leaves us really vulnerable to any unexpected financial burdens that come up, whether it's house-related, um, God forbid someone gets sick, anything like that. Um, and we're also, you know, obviously the lucky ones. We have the option to take eight weeks off. Um, a lot of people just can't go eight weeks without any source of income. Um, so it really puts at risk our mental and our physical health as well as the health of our children. Um, we suffer as a, from the result of not having the space and time to bond with new family. While the birth of a child is a time of endless love and joy, the transition into parenthood is equally full of overwhelming challenges and immense adjustments. A family and medical leave insurance program would be a life-changing support for the many entrepreneurs and self-employed business owners in Vermont and ultimately help young professionals stay in our great state and attract new families to settle here. So I really urge that we put back in self-employed business owners into the bill. Um, family and medical leave insurance is not complicated. Other states have taken the lead and Vermont has many good models to learn from. There's no need to prolong this hardship. The positive impacts of supporting growing families will have ripple effects throughout our society. We must move forward for the sake of our workforce, families, and economy. And I think I've cried at every single one of these testimonies. I don't know if it's the power of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Brenda Siegel, followed by Brenda Churchill. I'm Brenda Siegel. I live in New Cain, Vermont. I'm also a business owner. I direct the Southern Vermont Dance Festival. One month ago, almost to the day, my nephew Kaya, the son of my brother who passed away 20 years ago and whom I love like my own, died. It was unexpected because he had been doing extremely well and had been stable for almost a year. He died after a long battle of mental illness and eventually the disease of addiction, and after nearly an entire year of sobriety. Neither his mother or I had worked in an entire month. I am self-employed, she is not. I had to go to my subcontracted work at Mount Snow just two weeks after his death because I couldn't afford not to, but that's the only time that I have worked. And I'm at a loss now for how I will make up the income. I was sorry to see that bereavement is not included in this bill, as we know that we are not the only family that's experiencing this type of tragic loss in Vermont. Throughout his lifetime, my family, especially his mother and I, have had to juggle who would miss work to care for him. When that task fell on me, it was in part because I was self-employed and would not lose my job if I missed work. That did not leave me without financial burden. I still would have to make up my work pulling all-nighters to get it all done, which left me at considerable health risk. This is often how the burden falls because the risk of losing one's job is too great. In 2013, Kaya fell off of a roof and broke 27 bones. He had to have brain surgery, restructure his nose, have his upper palate rebuilt, forehead and nose essentially rebuilt and steel rod in his arm and his other arm was broken as well. This was an injury sustained from his illness, not from work. And because of work that we could not miss, his mother and I had to take turns sitting at Dartmouth during surgeries. Either of us had to miss some of the surgeries and throughout his stay. He had to be left alone once home at times with opiates for pain, making his chance at relapse even greater. Though this is a more extreme example of the times we had to care for him, there were times when he wanted, when we wanted to just be with him because he was struggling and needed us. There were times that someone needed to get him to treatment and we could not. 
There were times when he needed someone to be at the hospital with him, and there were times when we had no choice but to miss work, miss pay, and miss opportunities to care for him with no chance at recovering these losses. Kaya was an amazing kid and young man who was very bright, was extremely loving, and one of the funniest people I've ever met. Throughout his illness, my family remained very close to him and structured our lives to help him survive, and he had a better chance at success as a result of that support. He deserved every chance at survival, and we deserved every chance to help him survive without the risk of losing work or not being able to pay our bills. Not only is the burden on our families great when they are loved or when, when they are loved one or ill, but the burden on our state becomes great as well as, fam as well as families have to make as families have to make tough choices to leave stable jobs and be on state assistance so that their loved ones will have the care that they need. Illness, whether it be the disease of addiction, mental illness, cancer, chronic illness, or other diseases, takes a toll on multiple family members and ultimately on our community and our state. The bill that was passed in the House and sent to the committee is a start. It is still missing key elements that I hope the committee will consider including. Access to insurance for self-employed should be back in the bill. If employees are covering the cost, then it seems absurd that we would not include access for this large and important segment of Vermonters. Even if the committee chooses, which I think would be wise, to return to a bill that splits the cost between employee and employer, the self-employed would still be picking up the burden for their own insurance. It strikes me that this move would not carry much risk at all. Personal illness should be also be included in this bill. How could we be talking about the necessity to take time off and care for our loved ones if our loved ones can't take off time off and get the care that they need? Do we really want a Vermont where people work through cancer and chronic illness? Where our young people are dying because even if they have health insurance, they can't afford to miss work or risk losing their insurance? The bill should be brought back to its original coverage of 12 weeks and as close to 100% as is possible and offer much stronger protection for workers, no matter what size business. There are extremely few situations in which the work is so specialized that the worker should be subject to firing when they are sick or are caring for a loved one. The language in this current bill is far too broad and will leave Vermonters open to financial injury. My work is, is pretty specialized and I can usually find a replacement if I have to. I keep asking myself, what would I have done if I had to go to work in this last month? I would be, if I had been fired, if I did not. I couldn't do anything but go for walks, cry, be with family, and drink tea. I keep asking the same question about the past many years of caring for my nephew. We no longer have the opportunity to care for Kaya or see him thrive. But there are many families that need this right now. We are in the middle of an opiate crisis. There are many Vermonters suffering from chronic illness, mental illness, cancer, and other diseases, and they deserve to get the help that they need, and their families deserve the opportunity to help their loved ones survive. I am so grateful that somehow my family made sure to be there, to let Kaya know that he is loved and capable of loving, and that we were able to give him the chances of survival that were within our control. In the end, the time that you share with your loved ones is all you have, and our families need to know that they were able to do everything they could, and they had that time. Kaya's time here was made better by our family's ability to be by his side. Almost done. If just one life is changed or saved from this bill, it will be worth it. Ultimately, if we have a healthier Vermont, we have a stronger Vermont and a stronger, more vibrant economy. When we begin to look at strong policies that take care of our residents, not as just a lifeline, but also what we need to grow economically, then it stops being about us versus them, but rather all of us together. This bill, as it is now, is a step in the right direction, and with some of the stronger elements added back in, it will lead us to a brighter Vermont and our kids to a brighter future. Let us do what it takes to lead this country again. My family did not win this battle, but every family should have the chance to do everything they can to try. Thank you very much.
Lincoln Churchill, followed by Subedi. Good evening. My name is Brother Churchill from Bakersfield, Vermont. I'm here to testify as a private citizen and a member of the LGBTQ community. Thank you for having this public hearing. I want to tell you about my experience with paid family leave over the past 35 years of my life. I can sum it up by simply stating that I have been covered by several collective bargaining agreements, the result of being a union member for these past 35 years. These agreements have included paid family medical leave insurance. The benefits brought me and my family the ability to pay bills on time, buy food, and most importantly, get healthy again. I will admit that having a family medical leave benefit was a privilege that went with good wages and health insurance as a union member. I'm going to repeat that. My paid family leave was in combination with good wages and good health insurance. Without all three of these things, I would not be alive to testify here this evening. Paid family leave is a cornerstone benefit that clearly that clearly every member of my LGBTQ community needs. Consider this past influenza season. How many people came to work sick? How many of you were sick? How many folks got sick because coworkers came to work sick? How many kids got left home when they were sick and couldn't go to school <clears throat> and parents could not afford to care and could not lose their wage? Lost time, extra child care, wages that don't come in, is a vicious cycle of poverty that is perpetuated without paid family leave insurance. I never experienced any of that, but my LGBTQ community does, and I see the effects on family and on these kids. I know you do too. The cost of this needed insurance is very small, but the benefit to everyone, family, individuals, even employers, is huge. I urge you to please support H196 for paid family leave. Thank you for listening. What can I ask what union you are part of? Uh, two unions, uh, UAW, uh, which is United Auto Workers and Communication Workers of America. Thank you. Uh, Sue Betty, and followed by Cheryl Rinaldi. Did I pronounce that right? Betty? Yep. Perfectly. Thank you. Barbecue in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, we have approximately 30 employees year round, and uh, I'm wholeheartedly in support of this bill and for y'all making it better. Um, timing's kind of interesting because on this day last year, I woke up in the ICU at the Union Medical Center. Uh, the previous night, my partner had a pretty serious injury and a traumatic brain injury. So we were in the hospital for three days and then discharged without a plan, uh, which really created a pretty serious stress situation for myself, being a business owner and a now full-time caregiver. Uh, for the first month, she was what they call looping, which is saying the same questions over and over again. Obviously, she couldn't be left alone, so I was there. And uh, just so grateful for the privilege of having my role in my company to take the time that I needed to care for my partner. And then feeling so <coughs> disheartened that at our time our company doesn't have the resources to provide that opportunity for our team members. It was probably about a six month period of intense caregiving where members of our, my team helped support me. And I'm here to ask you to help small business owners like myself help create safe work environments where people can thrive with their whole lives and take the time off that they need. I kind of raced back to work because I felt like I needed to be there and I, I wanted to lead by example, but I wasn't there. I wasn't able to physically, really, mentally be there. I was kind of pretty stressed. I don't think it does anyone any good to rush back to work. I don't think. I, I don't think it really helps our economy. I think the time off helps our economy. It's kind of like, quite often we all feel like we're on a treadmill in life. Well, when you have an injury like this, or a traumatic event like this, or a child, the treadmill doesn't go faster, it starts going backwards. And you have to really work to stay on top and not fall behind. 
So I just ask you to really, really move this bill. I think it's incredibly important. I think it's a game changer. Just make it better. And uh, as an employer, you have our support. Like Randy, we happily contribute. I think this is going to make Vermont such a better place to work and live. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Shelley Rinaldi, followed by Carrie Carpenter.
And after that, I went through 20 weeks of chemo. <laughs> said I wasn't going to do this. It's <laughs> okay. So, So, 20 weeks of chemotherapy, followed by five and a half weeks of radiation therapy, which is five days a week. I had no disability. So, I was forced to work through all of this. Because if I didn't work, I didn't have a paycheck. So, uh, as a single mother, yeah, as a single mother of a teenage daughter, this is, you know, no, and I'll tell you, the number of people that said to me, I don't know how you do this, how you're still working, and that was my answer. I don't have a choice. I, I did not have a choice. I had to do it. People should not have to work through something like that. And the disparity in the bill as it stands right now, as it stands now, somebody can take time off to care for their family member while they're going through chemotherapy but they can't take time off for themselves while they're going through chemotherapy. That's a huge disparity, and that needs to be looked at. So that's something that I really want to encourage you to look at. So I'm totally straight off of what I, what I have written down. You're here, which is great, so you must be recovered. I'm still going through treatment. I still have an infusion that I have to get for a year. I'm almost at the end of that. But I still have another surgery coming. So I'll be out of work for probably another eight weeks. Um, again, I have to use my, my paid leave. So in two years, I have not had a vacation because all of my time has gone towards my medical treatment. And if we had, if we had this, this leave in place, it would have been a huge help. So, so I guess if something, I, I look at it that if something, maybe the reason this happened to me is that I can help this, help this move forward and it can help somebody else. So, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Hagelhoff, followed <coughs> by Mary Margaret Wilbur. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hagelhoff. I work at the Department of Vermont Health Access. I don't have a prepared um, statement, but I really wanted to come here and let you know about an experience that I've had recently. I work in the pharmacy unit. I've worked for Department of Vermont Health Access for 13 years. People come to me and ask, how can you help me with this? How can I do this? I need this type of health care. I've always been able to help people. Um, till a few, about a month ago, the, uh, a gentleman that works in our cafe at um, Waterbury State Office Complex came to me and told me that he desperately had to have surgery. And did, he, did I know of any way that he could get some funding to cover um, the cost of the six weeks he needed to take off? I told him I would look into it. I researched every possible avenue. The only thing I could come back to tell him is that 
I will help you set up a GoFundMe site. Okay? Um, and that did happen. He was able to get $2,000 out of the $3,000 he thought he needed to get him through the time off. He's a part-time, he has several part-time jobs in Vermont. He works at the cafe. He's a farmer in Berlin, um, in, which he had to have a fire sale for his chickens, by the way. And he also is a chef in local um, restaurants. Okay, so he's doing very well. Um, He's actually going to um, get back to work before he thought he would have needed to. But it was um, it was um, major abdominal surgery that he had to have. And another person I know who has cancer, um, she also did not have any um, disability insurance, although she was a full-time employee. Um, she has set up, she has a mar marketing degree and she has done marketing in Vermont, and she has um, set up a site for herself where she has raised about $25,000, and um, which she will need. She will need that money. Um, I pay for my disability insurance. I pay a lot of money for it. Um, I'm so glad it's offered to me. I don't know what I would do. Um, it doesn't pay my whole salary, but it would pay um, enough that I could survive. It's just not fair that someone who works three to four jobs in Vermont doesn't, you know, is dependent on um, others' goodwill. And a lot of people just don't have the money to contribute to that. I can't tell you how many um, people have contributed to their health care costs out of pocket um, just because there's no other resources for them. So please, please put in this um, bill the personal use of the funds and please push it to 12 weeks because that is just the minimum some people need. Thank you. You mentioned that you pay for your own disability insurance. You yes, that? I do. As a state, state employee, and they give you that option? Um, it's, I believe that I, my, it's, it's through the union, I believe. Okay. Yes. And I'm a proud union member. I'm um, a council member, and I am the vice president of the Waterbury chapter. So um, this affects so many people. And um, as an activist, I just implore you to expand it, approve it, make it better, and help us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary Margaret Grover, and this is our last witness. Is there anybody else? that would like to testify. One, two. And our youngest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How old is she? She's not testifying. She's 19 days old. <laughs> you think she's not testifying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's been quiet for the last hour and a half, and now she'll start. Um, my name is Mary Margaret Grover. I live in Montpelier, and this is my daughter, Molly, who was born two and a half weeks ago after a healthy pregnancy and an uncomplicated delivery at Central Vermont Medical Center. I'm very lucky to be part of the small minority of Vermonters who has access to paid family leave through my employer. But every day I think about how challenging and painful it would be if I had to be back at work right now, only 19 days into what the medical profession agrees is a minimum six week recovery time. Access to unpaid leave is access to no leave for almost everyone. Because it's so fresh for me, I thought it would be instructive for you to hear about what's going on with my body right now and what we're asking women to do when we deny them the ability to take sufficient time off to recover from childbirth. Because again, access to only unpaid leave is access to no leave. So I had stitches in my perineum, which tore during delivery, making it painful to sit, stand, walk, bend over, and lie down. And if you think that sounds like pretty much all forms of activity, you're correct. <laughs> um, the stitches also make it uncomfortable to wipe myself after I use the bathroom, so I have a spray bottle. At best, this would be awkward and embarrassing to handle in the workplace, and for many Vermonters, their work environment probably precludes it altogether. I'm still bleeding as the inside of my uterus heals the wound where the placenta detached. I may continue to bleed for off and on for another three weeks. I'm told by my doctors that strenuous activity may cause the bleeding to increase, and if that happens, 
I should back off and take it easy. Activities that have so far caused such an increase in bleeding include walking my dog and eating dinner with my family. Imagine how being back at work would affect this recovery. I'm breastfeeding my baby, a choice that is strongly supported by the State Department of Health if the number of pamphlets I've received are a measure. When I do go back to work, I'll have the use of a free breast pump thanks to the Affordable Care Act. However, the first few weeks of breastfeeding are essential for establishing my milk supply and my baby's ability to suck and swallow effectively. She's breastfeeding every one to four hours around the clock. One of my nipples is, still has some cracks in it, but thankfully both have stopped bleeding. My state government desperately wants me to breastfeed for my daughter's healthy development. There are state laws in place protecting my right to feed her in public, which I just did in the hall, and to pump for her when I'm at work. But for many, many Vermont women, these laws are moot if they're not also given time off that they can afford to establish breastfeeding in the first place. Having needs around the clock is of course not unique to breastfed babies or to newborns, but the added stress on my body of recovering from childbirth makes it very difficult to cope cope with the sleep deprivation in these early weeks. I'm so tired that I have to be reminded whether I've already taken medications, which has the potential to be very dangerous to my health. Imagine if I were your nurse, your delivery driver, or your daughter's teacher. I want to emphasize that I had a healthy pregnancy and a normal, uncomplicated delivery with access to excellent, affordable health care. Many women face much more painful and complicated recoveries or have to care for a sick baby at the same time. My husband and I moved to Vermont for a job opportunities five years ago, and for us this is not a hypothetical. People who move here or who are thinking about working here and growing our population and contributing to our economy are thinking about family leave and deciding whether or not to come here based on that. Um, and the fact that the state government does not offer family leave as a, a benefit is something that we notice too. Um, paid leave is not a special interest issue. It affects all of us and it benefits all of us. Thank you for your time. Is that your first job? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cecile Johnston. Good evening. I'm Cecile Johnston. I live in Cabot, Vermont. I am self-employed. I'm a seamstress just down the block. And um, I um, am very much in support of this bill in full, including 12 weeks and including people like me. And um, I, I, I'll come back a little bit, give you a little bit of background history, and just say that in um, 1999, I gave birth to a lovely baby girl who is now in the early college program. Um, at that time, my father and I both worked for nonprofits, and while I, I was pregnant, at the very end of my pregnancy, we both got hit with budget cuts, and we were both laid off. He was laid off completely. My job was cut to half time. It was pretty intense, and um, although he was eligible for unemployment, we were <coughs> in a jam, and especially then when my daughter was born and our income went to zero, um, we ended up living on credit cards, we ended up declaring bankruptcy, and th these are things that just don't have to happen. You know, I mean, taking the stress, that kind of stress on families, the testimony has been incredibly compelling, and I'm not going to get too much more into detail with my personal situation. But my guess is that if fewer people are up against that wall financially and emotionally, and if we take that stress away, we'll see the economy skyrocket because we'll see less depression. We'll see less, there's fewer people turn to stress relief measures that are ultimately harmful. It's really just the humane thing to do. But I'm gonna come a little bit more recent. Um, so as I said, I'm a seamstress, I'm self-employed, I no longer have any children at home. And I was walking down the sidewalk in November, had just made a deposit at the bank, was looking forward to a perfectly normal day at work, and I tripped on a crack 
and the sidewalk, and I broke a bone and tore a tendon in my right hand. That really knocked me for a loop. It was thousands of dollars of lost income as I was recovering from that. And in November, of course, I'm like in the middle of all of the holiday work that I'm doing and calling my clients, and I'm not able to take new work, and I'm sending off work to other people to get finished because I want my clients to have what they need. Um, I'm really hoping that you will put back in the measure that covers people like me. I hope never to be in that situation again. I hope nobody else is in that situation again. It is not fun. Um, if I, as it stands right now, we're getting into prom and wedding season, if I were to break my hand right now, I would close my business. It's, that would be the only choice I would have. Anyway, thank you for the time that you're taking to hear the testimony. And thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee. And I also thank the many voices that we've heard here. It, it, it's really remarkable the uh, expression of strength, resilience, and um, New England character. My name is Alan Reitz. I work with the Hanover Co op food stores. Since 1936, members of this consumer cooperative have been committed to concern for community and support for other locally owned businesses. Those themes are actually specified in the founding documents of the co-op 82 years ago. Today, as a cooperative, we have stores and facilities in both Vermont and New Hampshire. We're pleased to have 157 Vermont residents on our workforce, 75 of those work in our Vermont facilities. You know, looking beyond our mission statement or employment statistics, a business like ours also needs a strong local economy. Vermont producers and farms help make that possible. From Brattleboro to Grand Isle, Derby to Bennington, we source about 3,000 items from 231 Vermont businesses, food producers, and farms. The overwhelming majority of those Vermont businesses are small or tiny. Their stability matters to us. As a cooperatively owned business able to leverage benefits to attract and retain employees, we recognize H196 as an insurance option that will benefit and strengthen Vermont-based workers and businesses. Family and medical leave, including the ability to affordably cover one's own illness, or disability, or needs, strengthens businesses big and small by securing the most valuable asset of any firm, those people who do the work. We at the Hanover Co-op strongly support H-196 as a necessary benefit for the Vermont workforce and small business community. Successful passage of H-196 could also result in cost-effective means for employers who must provide leave under federal FMLA to fund their leave programs by paying the employee's portion of the insurance costs of the proposed program. This added benefit would free up resources for employers to use to buy more local goods, hire more local people, and pay them fairly. With our support, we, we, with our support for the creation of this program, we respectfully encourage the committee to restore the personal medical leave insurance component of the original bill and extend the leave to 12 weeks so that it will be adequate and accessible to Vermonters during a variety of unexpected or expected life events and it will mirror the maximum period now in place under the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. Thank you very much. Can I ask one question? Are there any other witnesses? Yes, there are. Okay. So, as a, a business owner or cooperative, uh, do you have any concerns about the bill that uh, it doesn't provide any job protection for people? Well, as, as a cooperative, we, we look at uh, the employee first as trying to provide benefits, so it's hard for me to um, uh, put myself in the shoes of, of those and being able to consider that. But, um, yeah, I, it would uh, cause concern. 
um, we, we see day in, day out that people are on the edge. Uh, the stories here were moving and sadly not surprising. So as a business, we need a stable economy, but we know when communities are strong, the, 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 it's not a trickle-down effect, it's a wave. So anything we can do to support employees and support businesses and do so in an environment that is balanced is something that we stand behind. So I don't know if I answered your question. I don't speak for our 23,000 member owners, but they are residents of the region, and for them, community is critical. And that starts with people. And, and, and just to be clear, there is job protection for people under the federal Yes, law, there is. But there's no added job protection for I below that right. I'm not just not to speak on behalf of others. I see this bill, and we see this bill as an important step in the right direction. Um, we need to make as wide a stride as possible. So we should consider that. I, I hope you'll take that into consideration, even though it's not been directly addressed. Thank you. Thank you. As one of your members. Thank you. Please come up. Thank you. Tell us who you are. I'm Rebecca Weber. I'm a resident of Montpelier, um, and I grew up in um, seventh generation Vermont. I grew up in Northfield. I have family all around the central Vermont area mostly. Um, <clears throat> I am a foster parent. Um, we, I'm part of a foster parent group on Facebook. We get daily requests for placements for kids. I don't. I have a child in my home. I don't have space um, in my license for another child at the moment. Um, but there's a tremendous need for foster parents. Um, I've had a kiddo for 11 months. I miss a day to two days a week meeting her needs. Um, kiddo, she's a teenager. Um, that's doctor's appointments, including making up for ones that were missed when she was with her family. Mental health, therapy, court, DCF appointments. Um, she doesn't actually do family visits, but family visits can vary. With infants, it might be daily on weekdays, um, you know, to three times a week for a lot of kids. Um, there's a tremendous amount that has to happen. I do have, I am using FMLA for her. Um, it's not parental leave because she's not a foster child that's being placed for adoption, so there's some language in the parental leave at the moment that doesn't, um, she doesn't quite apply, but but I was able to do it as a medical leave because all the a lot of these appointments are interconnected. Um, but it's unpaid, um, and I've eaten up all of the leave that I had saved, both sick and annual. And probably within the next few weeks, I'll be taking unpaid leave for all of those appointments, which aren't going to stop anytime soon. Um, and so I've had her for 11 months. I'll probably have her longer. But if, I, if she left my home and another kid and, and, and DCF asked if I could take another child, I would have to seriously consider whether I could do that. Not because I'm too heartbroken by the system or because I'm too worn out by the kids, because I cannot afford it. Um, and I do know a few families, foster families, with a stay-at-home parent who spends their whole day driving kids around, but I know a lot more families like mine where people are taking leave, and no matter how understanding your job is, it's still unpaid leave. Um, I do work for the state, um, so I and, and the leave policy is is lovely. It's unpaid. Um, I I have short-term facility that the person who spoke before. Um, it's through the union. It's it's AFLAC, and it's forty dollars a pay period, so eighty dollars a month. If I have short-term disability, it doesn't cover any kind of FMLA for you know for any of what I'm actually doing, um, and so I just I think paid family leave is really something that we deserve to to have in our communities. Every single one of us benefits from it because every single one of us has parents or kids or spouses or somebody who at some point is going to need our time or ourselves um, and I and I and I think also recognizing that foster parents have a special need 
and the ability of foster parents to continue to foster the kids in our communities who need to be fostered is dependent on their ability to, to continue to have a livelihood that isn't possible without paid family leave. Um, and I would encourage you to think about extending it to 12 weeks. Um, six weeks is a normal recovery as uh, you know, someone testified. My short-term disability would be eight weeks if I had a cesarean section. So six weeks is, it, it, it seems like a lot until you're actually sick or until you actually have a baby or, and then it's not very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that ends the hearing. I just want to say that uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out. The testimony was to a person, very moving and informative. And I know it's not easy for a lot of you to come out and talk in front of other people, especially tell your own personal stories, but it's important for us to hear that. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. I wish you all well. Thank you.